All right, everyone, it's time for the occult video 177, how the story of Satan replicates the gun debate. It's actually uh, interesting. I was thinking of this. I was like uh, ruminating on the concept of Lucifer the Fallen. You know, I know that the word Lucifer is not a proper noun. It's it's a description of, you know, giving off light, being, being phosphorescent, quite literally. It's a mistranslation from the original Greek of the New Testament. It refers to Jesus. It doesn't refer to the devil. It doesn't refer to Satan. So I, when people use the term Lucifer, I know that they're, you know, they're full of shit. They don't understand uh, even anything about this being. They're using the wrong word. Uh, but we're just going to use the common term, which is, you know, the fall of Lucifer. It's not the fall of Satan or whatever. The devil, the fallen angel, the rebel, the cosmic, uh, the prince of hell, <laughs> whatever you will. I was thinking about the gun control debate, uh, the concept that You've got essentially, increasingly, you've got two camps. You've got people who want you to be able to be an individual, defend yourself, defend your property, and then you have people who are collectivists. They're fucking commies, basically. They don't want you to defend yourself. They want you disarmed. They want you to rely upon an ineffective, inefficient, highly centralized, worthless fucking government in order to protect you. Um, they are a little bit like the concept of the tyrant Jehovah within, if you look at the, uh, the story of the fall, really what you get if you're interpreting it properly and the pagans did because they invented this story before the the Jews and Christians began using it like a thousand years before people in Babylon and Samaria were already talking about this shit and their understanding was it was actually good like when when Satan for instance in the garden is giving the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil to you know Adamu and Eve basically it's considered a good thing by the pagans. They're like, oh, this is basically, this is the origins of, of our ability. We built that ziggurat. We can irrigate crops. We have a language. We have potsherds and, and we can make, you know, work with metal and stuff. We have copper tools. All of these things were made possible because of the wonders of, you know, variously, uh, Satan, a snake, Prometheus, Anki, Eridu, any of these other uh, figures throughout pagandom. And really... Uh, that's uh, considered a good thing. The Jews and Christians, of course, the Jews in a primordial sense, having been, you know, under, not slavery, but having been in bondage to the Babylonians for a time, naturally they inverted the story. They're like, well, these people, they see this as a good thing. It must be bad because, you know, look at them. They're, you know, they're these weird tribes <laughs> trying to uh, screw us over, keep us in bondage, keep us in captivity. The, so this being that they venerate must be evil. It's a demon. It's it's a it's a ball, but it's not like it's not ours. It's not our Yahweh. It's not our Jehovah. It's it's an evil god of sorts. And they were henotheists and believed that. They didn't want individuality. They saw it as a collective thing in the in the most uh, strict sense. Under the Judaistic sort of philosophy of that time, you've got the concept of an insular tribe that, unlike others, was not readily mixed with others. There's literally, according to their religious dictates, they were not to mix with anybody. It was a sin. It was evil for them to actually do that. Other tribes were like, they mixed it up a little bit. They had parties. You hear about in the Greek city-states, they get together from time to time. There's obviously some wine, women, and song going on. They didn't have really a problem with this. This is both, by the way, a strength and a weakness, depending on <laughs> sort of the situation. The Luciferian, uh, the satanic concept, is that of individuality. What does Satan do? What is he ultimately rebelling against? He's rebelling against the concept of being commanded to bow before something lesser than he is, in the same way that an individual uh, refuses to take the dictates of the state and would rebel uh, when commanded to cheapen themselves, uh, make themselves less than a citizen. If you have the ability to own firearms, to defend yourself effectively, uh, individua individually or in, or in a more organized sense, if you have that, you're a citizen. You can do as you wish. You are a free person. All of your other rights, at the very least, ultimately are guaranteed by force. There is, by the way, no other way to guarantee rights. Rights don't simply magically and naturally exist unless you can defend them. So if you don't like liberty, the best way to do that is to prevent people from adequately defending it. If they can't defend it, they don't have liberty. Their liberty, ultimately the natural right that is defended by their ability to fight back against tyranny is converted into a privilege that is only guaranteed by the whims of an organized state. It's been an ever-present problem in society after society. How do you have a society that's not well armed and yet it can continue to be free for any great degree of time. All you need is one corrupt individual to take over. One group of plutocrats can say, oh, yeah, fuck the poor. 
one group of oligarchs can say, oh, you know, screw these little people here. They're, they're not smart enough to govern themselves. All you need is one family or one person to get in bed with the military and all of a sudden you've got a dictatorship or maybe a monarchy or something. The concept, by the way, of individual liberty, it doesn't really appear uh, in non-pagan cultures for the most part. You, you look around at the lore of the pagans, it's much more libertarian, generally speaking, than what you get from Christendom generally. Uh, in Christendom, you get a very regulated, uh, legalistic system, not a lot of wiggle room in there. There is some, there are a few exceptions. Uh, for instance, Catholic monks involved with the brewing process, which, <laughs> trust me, their lords and ladies loved their ale too. Now, uh, they developed the concept that there would be a, a, like a room in the monastery that wasn't counted as the monastery, just so they could go there and drink more than their allotment of two pints a day. Like, the, the monks would go there and they'd sing and get drunk and do all sorts of stuff once they shut the door and it was considered, you know, ultimately they knew, hey, you know, was, we praise, the, praise Jesus, uh, you know, praise the Lord, but you know, we're still human beings. We can't help it. Some of them also visited prostitutes and had wives at the time. You know, back then it wasn't considered uh, a sin to do so. The concept of a, of a perpetually virginal clergy hadn't entered into people's minds as much yet. It was over property, basically, and there have been murmurings they might try to rescind that at some point. Yeah, if the Pope really, if the Catholic Pope really wanted to be progressive, he'd do that. But I see the gun debate as Luciferian in nature. That is, you have people uh, on the individualistic side who say, I have the right to defend myself. There's no way I can have liberty guaranteed at all uh, without the threat of force. The, the hope of threat of force, the presence of the ability to use force, is not to actually have to use it. That is, if you're the biggest bear, you don't have to actually fight the other bears. They're not going to mess with you. If they do, you can you know, do a bluff charge or two. They'll run off. You don't actually come to blows. It's when you are weak that you have to worry because then you're at the whims of the strong. So by having a strong populace to counterbalance the government, it helps liberty to be perpetuated. This is it's a, it's the same concept as the concept of checks and balances. Like the U.S., by the way, it was built by a bunch of deistic masons. It wasn't ultimately built by people who were fundamentally uh, uh, highly Christian. They weren't church lovers. They liked Jesus. They said, oh, there's a God. They also thought that that God blessed drunkenness, had no problem with it. Uh, using drugs, uh, that was a-okay. It was okay to be into astrology and fortune telling. And you can read works by some of these people. Some of, some of the early notorious figures of, of this period of time in the Enlightenment, and even before that, some of the pe people involved the Salem witch trials, believe it or not, they were into all this mystic stuff. They were into the concept of libertarianism in its most stringent sense. Uh, they didn't like authority. Quite clearly, a state, a church, whatever it happened to be, uh, they saw it as potentially problematic. There's a reason why they wanted military armaments in private hands at the time. They wanted an armory system for an organized militia, the states administering that. They also wanted people to be able to own as much armament as possible themselves so that hopefully you'd be well armed enough, other people would generally leave you alone. The fact that you have strength means you don't even need you know, the standard military as much. Who's going to mess with you? You know, in the modern age, that falls apart a little bit, but it's still very much in effect. Nobody could affect a land, a land invasion of North America. You know, in Mexico, yeah, you could uh, do a land invasion there because the population is disarmed. Canada and the U.S. both have far too many firearms for that to be an effective strategy. No, it's a form of strength. It's a form of liberty. It takes stress off the culture and helps liberty to be more uh, feasible. Liberty is not feasible if you don't have the ability to defend yourself. So I see Judeo-Christianity... Uh, really is as uh, almost a collectivism of sorts. You know, Jesus himself saying, well, if someone's smacking you in the face, give him the other cheek. Don't fight back. He, he's telling people, he's giving people a very radical ascetic manifesto and saying, no, you don't even like need anything other than a robe. You don't even get sandals and a staff. Wander around and be homeless. It doesn't matter. Look, the physical world passes away. It belongs to Satan. Who cares? Meanwhile, someone who's more on, on, on the Luciferian or individualistic side says, ah, okay, you go off and wander into the hinterlands. Go ahead. Don't ask me to do so. And if any state wants me to be basically uh, a disarmed, enslaved peasant like you're going to be, whether to a god, a church, a state, whatever, no, not going to happen because I'm going to defend myself. That's about all. Peace out.